Um, good afternoon. I'm Amy Lambert, and I'm co-chair of the Maryland Commission on Climate Change's Education, Communication, and Outreach Working Group. I also serve as Director of Communications at EA Engineering, Science, and Technology, a national environmental consultancy based out of Hunt Valley. Before we begin, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, we ask that all attendees keep microphones muted. Chat should, should have been disabled. And we're also asking not to use the raise hand functions. Instead, please use the question and answer feature, which is available through the activities icon. It looks like three geometric symbols and is located at the bottom right corner of the Google Meet screen. Questions will be hidden once submitted to avoid distraction and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation as time allows. This presentation is being recorded and we plan to post to YouTube, assuming that we can download a, a quality recording. Now, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Suzanne Dorsey. In June, she was appointed as the Maryland Department of the Environment's Deputy Secretary. Sorry, I'm doing two things at once. <laughs> um, she was appointed as the, the Maryland Department of Environment's Deputy Secretary and also the chair of the Maryland Commission on Climate Change. Dr. Dorsey has been the agency's assistant secretary since February 2019, working with the agency's Water and Science Administration on Chesapeake Bay restoration and on major issues that require cross-agency coordination on climate resiliency. Previously, she was executive director of the Harry R. Hughes Center for Agroecology at the University of Maryland, and also was executive director of the Bald Head Island Conservancy and Smith Island Land Trust for 11 years. She's a former commissioner of the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management and professor at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and Salem College. She has a bachelor's degree in biology, master's degree in marine estuarian environmental science from University of Maryland and a PhD in oceanography from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Dr. Dorsey. Uh, th thanks so much. I appreciate this opportunity to just give a, a brief overview and introduction to the priorities of the Climate Commission. Um, I, I want to share with you that the Climate Change Commission is um, simultaneously and incredibly challenging and very often inspiring group of people that seek to make recommendations about how we can address the challenges that come with the changing climate. Um, the commission and, and um, Kim Coble will, will go into detail, but just on a broad scale, it is bipartisan, it is independent, and it has diverse representation, including environmental NGOs, state energy, ener state agencies, energy companies, uh, representatives from the building sector and, and transportation sector, for instance. Um, what are our priorities, especially during this transition period? Um, it is essential this year, especially, that the Climate Change Commission continue to make realistic progress while keeping in mind a strong economy, a strong and diverse economy. We need to make progress to address the challenges of climate change. We're not all impacted by climate change in the same way, right? Some of our communities will be more impacted than others. And, and frankly, some of our Maryland communities are already feeling the effects of climate change. Um, today, we know that there are communities that are impacted by flooding and heat, for instance. Other communities are already being impacted economically as some jobs are lost and new jobs in green energy and environmental restoration become more available. On the Lower Eastern Shore, where I am today, the water tables are rising, and, and the discussion I had this morning was about failing septics um, regionally. If you look carefully, you'll notice that the first communities that fall victim to climate change are most often our most vulnerable communities, those communities that may already be burdened by pollution or poverty or, or lack of access to resources. We call this reality environmental justice, or in the case of climate change, climate justice. And to recognize this, um, last year we um, put in place a climate justice working group as part of our climate change commission. Now is the moment that we need to respond to climate change, but we have to recognize that 
in order to act, we have to protect all Marylanders, particularly our most vulnerable area Marylanders. Some industries like coal-fired plants have converted to other energy sources and, and this can result in job transitions that leave some people stranded. We want to recognize that all people deserve to be considered in this Maryland Climate Change Commission and work towards making sure that no one's left behind, that everybody has the opportunity to transition in a changing um, environment. Today, under the leadership of Secretary Horacio Tablado, we are going to continue to work hard to develop tools to make everybody, to make sure that every Marylander thrives. As we consider how to transform Maryland's energy, transportation, and building sectors while building a thriving economy, we want to make sure that we consider affordability in our decision making. We want to address historic inequity in environmental investing, and we want to take advantage of innovations in technology and science to achieve our goals. We want to use new financing to leverage the growing interest from the private sector in climate change investing. And we want to enhance our efforts to reduce greenhouse gases with Maryland's natural and working lands. It's important to remember that Maryland is a global leader. I can't tell you how exciting it is to be able to represent Maryland on a national or global um, scale. We are blessed with a sophisticated way of protecting our environment that leverages science and measurement with goal setting. This approach has allowed us to begin the process of restoring our Chesapeake Bay, which by the way, is our number one investment in resilience. When our bay and its tributaries and watersheds are healthy, then those natural systems can protect us when intense weather pattern, patterns threaten us. Another national leadership effort is the Five Million Trees Collaborative. We're working with other state agencies, um, with the Chesapeake um, Bay Trust to build uh, urban trees, to plant trees as natural filters and carbon sequestration and also to build carbon markets within the state. Do you know that Maryland had the first in the nation Living Shoreline Act? That made sure that uh, salt marshes are considered as a first line of defense when protecting our shorelines against erosion. First in the nation. By uh, restoring wetlands, we're also building carbon sequestration. Do you know that our state is a global model for beneficial reuse of dredge materials? Some of you have heard of Poplar Island. It's a global restoration landmark, and it not only restores, uses dredge material, but it builds blue carbon by building wetlands. Our municipal separate storm, uh, storm and sewer system, or MS4 permits, prioritize green infrastructure, like forests, um, growing trees, grassy buffers. These approaches not only help with flooding, but also clean stormwater and sequester carbon. It's really important that you know that we have a first in the nation conservation finance act that supports private sector funding to leverage public funding to sequester carbon and achieve pollution reductions. Um, most of all, I want you to know that we have the best in the nation climate program within our state agencies. Chris Hoagland is leading the Air and Radiation Administration. Mark Stewart and Chris Beck serve as program manager and deputy manager for our climate program within the Maryland Department of the Environment. We have lofty goals and specific practical approaches to move forward with humility, recognizing that we're likely to make some mistakes, but we really need your help. I call on you today to write, to call, to engage in the public process, to help us rise to the challenge of our day and build equity into public policy as we address climate change. Thank you so much for attending this workshop. We look forward to seeing you at uh, the other meetings of the Climate Commission. Next slide, please. I want to introduce Senator Paul Pinsky, who has been a leader within the Climate Commission. Um, he represents our 22nd District of Prince George's County in the State Senate. He's the chair of our Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Community. He is the main sponsor of the Climate Solutions Now Act. He is a passionate 
passionate participant in our Climate Change Commission and is determined to make progress for the state of Maryland to address climate cha uh, change. So with that, I'd like to welcome Senator Pinsky. Um, Kim, are you going before me? Yeah, I, I think I'm next, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, did I get the order wrong? Uh, my apologies. Let me introduce Kim Koble, again, a very passionate um, representative of all of our state um, to make sure that we move forward with climate change. Um, Kim has incredible experience um, and background, um, including um, conservation finance um, in the form of sustainable and responsible investment. She's um, right now the uh, executive director of the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Are we going to go through all the introductions first? Yes. yes we are. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. I'll, I'll finish these introductions. Uh, Mike Powell, again, serves as um, an important co-chair of the Mitigation Working Group. He's a member of the Gordon Feinblatt's Energy and Environmental Practice Group and serves as principal counsel, uh, in the past has served as principal counsel for the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, Mike often ensures that the Climate Commission really thinks about the practical consequences of the decisions that we make. So I welcome Mike to the conversation as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kim Coble, and as Suzanne said, I'm the executive director for the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. I also serve as a co-chair for the Maryland Climate Change Commission, and I'm co-chair with Mike Powell of the Mitigation Work Group. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've got a big agenda for you, and I'm going to just briefly go over what the commission is and does, and then I'll turn it over to Senator Pinsky and Mike Powell to talk about uh, what is considered the most significant climate bill in the country this year, the Climate Solutions Now Act. Next. So the Maryland Commission on Climate Change, its primary purpose is to be an advisor to the governor and to the Maryland General Assembly regarding the mitigation of climate change impacts, how to prepare for them, and how to adapt to them. And uh, we, the structure of this commission is really based on that, those purposes. Next. It was uh, originally established in 2007 through an executive order. In 2009, it produced a climate action plan that served as a catalyst for what has become known as the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act the GGRA. The GGRA had, was written and has also in 2016 and has been revised and updated and really serves as the plan for the commission um, to design around. So it, the plan says, here are the reductions that we need, here's the actions, and then the commission just figures out the actions to get to the goals that are set out in that plan. In 2014, another executive order was drafted to continue the, the commission, expand its scope and its membership. And in 2015, the commission was then codified. So it is now in law that this commission exists. I want to emphasize again, as Suzanne pointed out, that we are an independent statutory body. Uh, we are not uh, beholden to the governor or the Maryland General Assembly, but we function independently. All meetings are open to the public and the Maryland Department of Environment uh, does an excellent job of staffing the commission. Next. There are 29 representatives on the commission itself. They represent state agencies, local agencies, legislature, business, and nonprofit organizations. There's a chair and three co-chairs. Um, there are standing members. There are members that are appointed by the Senate president. There's members that are appointed by the House Speaker and there's members that are appointed by the local, uh, by local government. Next, the commission each year produces an annual report and they've done this since 2015. Uh, the reports have um, each year become more robust. And last year, the annual report presented 54 recommendations to the governor and the Maryland General Assembly um, of actions that should be taken in order to meet the goals of the GGRA. 
Um, the re annual report was almost unanimous, but it was had strongly supported by all members of the commission. Next. And lastly, there are four work groups in the commission and the membership in these work groups are expanded beyond those 29 members. So if you have a particular interest in one of these work groups, please reach out. We're always looking for people to participate in them. But briefly, uh, let me start with the adaptation and resiliency work group. This work group it does exactly that. It looks at the problems and the solutions around adapting and building resiliency to climate change impacts. There's an education, communication, and outreach work group, the ECO work group. And this webinar is sponsored by that work group. So they are responsible for ensuring that information is uh, made readily available to the public, to interested parties, and that uh, we have a good communication mechanism um, about our work and, um, and including input in our work. The mitigation work group is the hub that Mike Powell and I co-chair that really looks at how do we reduce the impact of climate change? How do we prevent emission reductions? Or how do we achieve emission reductions? And um, many of the actions that were discussed and part of climate solutions now were discussed as part of the mitigation work group and lastly there's a scientific and technical work group that really makes sure that the recommendations are based on science that we have the most current and up-to-date information as we look at solutions and recommendations um, so the commission is made up with of these work groups and then re, um, each work group reports up to the total commission that's an overview of, of our work and um, what we do. And I'll now turn it over to Senator Pinsky to discuss the Climate Solutions Now Act. Thank you, uh, Kim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here, um, so thanks. Let me start by saying two things. Let's go back to the title slide for a moment. Um, there are two aspects to the, the new law. Uh, one, the overreaching and overarching goals that we need to approach and achieve over the next number of years, but also some specific policies and practices that the state can lead in. Um, you know, we think that leaving it too general without some uh, guide down the pathway or simply putting a few policies in place but not have um, the, the ultimate goal we need to achieve to uh, to reduce uh, climate change in this nation, in the state and around the world uh, would be a mistake. So we've done both, uh, general goals and some specific policies. But that being said, um, we offer some concrete policies the state can act on and the, and the private sector can act on immediately. But I wanna be clear, those acts alone will not get us to the 60%. Um, we've achieved some low hanging fruit. We've offered some concrete strategies for the next two, five, 10 years, but a lot more needs to be done. Uh, next. Uh, as you've probably heard, we call for a 60% reduction by 2031 um, and then net zero by 2045. The, the near term, the 2031, makes us, Maryland, have the most aggressive near term uh, goal in the country. And, and I believe even the 2045 puts us one of the few states by legislation to call for our net zero emissions by 2045. So this has put Maryland back to where it belongs to be in the forefront of the states. We've lagged behind the last number of years, um, but we think uh, this bill and the trajectory we've taken uh, puts us uh, in the right pathway uh, going forward. Uh, next. Uh, other than transportation, which I believe uh, emits the most uh, emissions, uh building uh commercial buildings multifamily, residential is the second uh leading emitter of greenhouse gases so that was a focus a large focus of the legislation uh some we actually uh adopted some we said we have to look at a little more but we have a clear intent and and one of those is what we call electrification and that is to have all uh energy come through electric wires rather than pipe um, so at the end of the day, the legislature uh, made clear its intent uh, to move towards electrification of new buildings, but we put together a very extensive 
thoughtful study, 15 months, to look at how we would accomplish this. And the reason for all electrification is if you begin to lay pipe, you have to justify that pipe. And that means using natural gas and oil, which we clearly have to move away from. We need clean energy. And in the interim, uh, we want to have an infrastructure that allows itself to use that clean energy rather than old ways of uh, doing business. Um, the, the other factor is we say that by 2030, 75% of the electricity procured by the state uh, comes from no or low carbon sources. Uh, next, please. The Climate Solutions Now Act was very clear that we have to get existing and new buildings to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we have um, uh, quantified and put into law that any building, um, commercial, uh, multifamily, over 35,000 square feet, must achieve a 20% reduction by 2030 and a net zero by 2040. So what does that mean? Um, it means that we are going to benchmark over the next two years and set standards by sector of what the average emissions is currently and then what a 20% reduction would mean. But all buildings are not the same. So we are going to benchmark particular types of buildings and decide what a 20% reduction would be. Uh, additionally, there are some companies, developers, builders who've already started to think green and build green. And if they have done things that get us to that 20% reduction, they'll get credit for it. So we don't want people to wait for us. We want people to think green, do green, uh, use green architects and style of development uh, that helps us achieve that 20% reduction. Um, look, there are gonna be some exclusions, um, historic buildings, agricultural buildings. Uh, but we need to set energy use intensity targets by building type, understanding some differences in types of building, age of uh, building, and where they uh, take place. We also understand that in many cases, this will be a savings in cost. Uh, in some cases, it might be expensive. So we've put together a task force uh, that will be created to consider uh, whether and what types of incentives may be needed to get those um, projects and reductions in place. We don't want people just to pay into a fund and say, and to shake their hands and say, I'm, I'm clean, I'm free, I'm done. Uh, that's not what we want to do. We want to move all buildings uh, to this reduction because uh, ultimately, while they're tough decisions to make and significant changes, we have to get involved in that area. Uh, additionally, we set up a climate transition clean energy hub so we can have a center in the state for technical assistance, information, and almost be a traffic cop to where people should go to get additional resources and, and assistance. Uh, next slide, please. You know, I mentioned transportation uh, being uh, one of the, the largest emitter in the state. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, a tough challenge and we don't resolve all of the, the uh, approaches and methods to reduce in the transportation sector. Uh, we personally, I believe we have to move towards more mass transit, get more cars off the road, electrify more vehicles, but we don't address all of those issues in this, in this act, uh, SB 528. We do do a few things, however. We say that uh, all new uh, electric school buses, replacement uh, buses for all school systems uh, should be zero emissions as federal funds from the infrastructure bill become available. Uh, there's a large chunk of money in the federal money for uh, school bus replacement to make them zero emissions. We'd like Maryland to be first in line for all 24 jurisdictions. Um, so that, that is one aspect. Secondly, there's a very specific school bus pilot program that has been tried in a few areas where school systems have partnered with energy companies where they would pay for the zero emissions vehicles, uh, electrified vehicles, which would be used during the 10 months uh, for schools and not have the emissions we have now, which result in asthma and other uh, illnesses to our young people, particularly in some of our disproportionately affected community. But then when the school bus aren't being used in the summer, the energy companies could utilize those buses for the energy they're creating. So we think it's uh, creative. We think it's one uh, opportunity 
to uh, shift to uh, all electric or, or zero emission vehicles. And if we can partner in some cases, we think it's a, a great thing to explore. Finally, in the uh, transportation area, uh, you know, it's a no-brainer. The, the state needs to lead by example. So we call for the state's uh, passenger vehicle fleet, and they have it, every agency has automobiles, um, to when they reach their life cycle, whether it's six, eight, 10, 12 years, they get replaced by electric vehicle. The price is coming down, uh, particularly on smaller cars. So we, we think the state should lead in that effort. And so we can ensure that by early 2030s, <coughs> that all the state vehicles and light duty fleet uh, have transitioned to uh, clean energy. Uh, next slide, if you would. You know, uh, Kim mentioned environmental justice and, and so did uh, Suzanne. Um, it's a lens that hasn't been used adequately in the past. Many of our communities have been disproportionately affected. Um, whether the coal-fired power plants have been in their neighborhoods, uh, quarries, whatever it might be. And they've uh, been affected uh, health-wise, mental health, physical health, and a lot of other, uh, in a lot of other capacities. So the bill spends a lot of time trying to uh, reverse what might be considered environmental injustice. Um, first, we uh, identify impacted communities, that, those that have been disproportionately affected. And obviously it's in many of our black and brown communities. And then we want to assess how much money is being invested uh, to reduce emissions in those areas. And then we call for uh, the uh, Environmental Justice Commission, which exists, to come up with recommendations to bring the legislature so we can close this loop and put the focus in those communities to rectify some of the ills that they have had to bear. We also do so a number of other things in, in climate justice uh, area. And one is uh, investments in community solar. If they can be made in uh, some of these poor and underserved communities, uh, we want to remove the taxation. We want to have incentives for investment uh, to for community solar to have more clean energy coming into these communities and reduce the bills for the people who who live in those areas. You know, we can make uh, the transition to climate and, and a clean environment uh, financially uh, positive to the community. We can save money. You know, we can reduce bills for for heating our homes or cooling our homes. And that's clearly one of our intents in this bill. And finally, in this area, and there may be some others, we were giving an overview today. Um, we create, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, the Climate uh, Catalytic Capital Fund to invest in, uh, in uh, new types of energy and leverage private money. We want to make sure a significant portion of that investment uh, takes place in low and moderate income communities. So uh, we explicitly require that. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that fund in just a moment. Uh, let's go to next slide. When we shift energy types, uh, it's going to affect real human beings. There are people who, who work in coal-fired power plants, and they, as we probably know, are shutting down. Well, the question is, how do we address those working families who are affected by it, who might be out of work? You know, is retraining enough? Is getting them jobs that compare in terms of wages, hours, and benefits? Uh, we can't just ignore that issue. We have to make sure that uh, there's a just transition is what we use in terms of job loss and job creation. Some communities uh, of workers will be affected significantly negatively, and there's some that will actually increase jobs. We've got to come up with a plan a thoughtful plan with all the stakeholders to look at that transition and see if any state support is needed and to do it in an orderly fashion. <clears throat> Additionally, um, there are going to be fe some federally fund used on our climate reduction efforts, and we want to make sure all of them will utilize uh, prevailing wages and benefits. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> I mentioned the uh, Climate Catalytic Capital Fund or the 3C Fund. We know there are a, there's a lot of private money where people want to invest in clean energy, um, but they might not have the money to get them over the hump. 
we are in investing $15 million over three years to leverage that private investment. We're going to work that through the Clean Energy Center, Maryland's Clean Energy Center, which has been uh, functioning for a number of years and does a great, great job. Uh, Kathy does a great job there. And we want to uh, encourage more investment in clean energy, whether it's wind or battery uh, re retention of energy or, or solar, whatever it might be, or new technologies we're not even using yet. Uh, we want to have investors come to our state knowing we'll help them in a transition and be able to loan the money to get them to invest the kind of money we need uh, here in Maryland. Um, we also expand what's called Empower, and that's utility investment in clean energy. Um, we need more energy efficiency. We need more insulation. We need more effective windows. We need more uh, programmable thermostats. Um, we need to do that in our, in our working communities, our poor communities, and there's a lot of work yet to be done, but it takes some upfront capital to do that and accomplish that. Uh, and uh, finally, there are a number of other work groups uh, that are put in uh, through the legislation, energy industry revitalization, resilience and efficiency, and how do we uh, address solar recovery and reuse when panels uh, come outdated, et cetera. So let, let me go to the uh, last slide if we can. And finally, uh, these are areas, particularly the first area, we set up a Chesapeake Conservation Corps about six or eight years ago to get young people to work for a year after high school, after college, uh, on Bay-related issues. And um, they get a decent salary, uh, they get experience, and hopefully they join the environmental sector uh, for a lifetime career. Well, we have taken the next step and said that we've got to put a, an additional focus for young people, particularly people of color, who are in Baltimore, in Prince George's, on the Eastern Shore, um, who also need uh, assistance. And, and we've created an expansion that will employ 30 to 40 uh, young people, I guess anywhere from 17 to 25 or so, who will work for up to a year and make $15 an hour and work with other organizations, nonprofits, local government entities. And whether in Baltimore, whether it's planting trees, or helping homes become more energy efficient, um, these young people will be invest in their community. They'll invest in addressing climate change and hopefully also see a career ladder into working in, in the green industry, the green community, and working uh, for the broader good for the whole public. So we are very excited about that. It will work under the Bay Trust, which uh, Kim mentioned a little earlier, that has been very active in climate change and, and uh, Chesapeake Bay as well. A couple of other items. Uh, we fund, do further funding for a Healthy Soils program. Uh, healthy Soils is a great way to absorb um, uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. We think that's a very positive issue. And, and you'll see uh, methane emissions. Methane, they say, is 50 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Uh, it, it is produced in landfills and other areas and leaks and pipes. Um, we've got to do a better job. Um, and we have to count it more effectively when we decide what our inventory is and how much we have to reduce. And to be honest, the measurements that we, we found from on land and from the air have been very different. So we have to get a handle on one, how significant methane emissions are across our state, and then put some things in place to reduce those methane emissions. And finally, let me end on this. Um, climate impacts every agency in our state. You know, we've got to make sure that any decision any uh, agency makes, whether it's the health department, environment department, natural resources, uh, social services, whatever, uh, they consider climate impacts in all of the work they do. Um, we can't ignore this. And, and more specifically, uh, we also think that as decisions are made, policies are made, and investments are made, uh, we have to look through that lens of what is the implication for disproportionately uh, impacted communities. So look, this is sometimes been called an omnibus bill. It has many aspects to it, and there are probably some I wasn't able to mention. 
I had a limited period of time. It would probably take a couple more hours, uh, which we're not going to do today. So uh, I want to thank everyone involved with this, um, the, the House and the Senate, um, Delegate Stein, Delegate Barbe, and obviously my colleagues in the Senate. Uh, it took a lot of work. Uh, it took a couple of years and a lot of grassroots attitudes to get us to where we are. But this is just step one. Uh, we're not done. In, in fact, it's, it's a starting point. It's a pathway, which I think leads us to our, our next presenter, uh, Mr. Michael Powell, who's going to talk about the challenges ahead. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, as the Senator mentioned, the, the specific proposals that are in the Climate Solutions Now Act uh, do not get us to the overall goal. Um, we clearly have to do additional work. Uh, and I'm going to try to outline some of the work we expect the Commission to be focused on there. And I should add as a, as a caveat, uh, I am one of the two uh, general business representatives on the Commission. Uh, I don't speak for the Commission, um, and I'm going to be trying to summarize the views of the Commission. I, some I agree with, some I don't, but this is where I think the Commission is going to go. Uh, and you should be aware of them. But I'm also going to challenge each of you uh, to provide input to the Commission about where you think the Commission should go. Uh, where do we find uh, the additional um, uh, reductions uh, to meet the standards of the Act? Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a history of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland. Uh, the blue line are the greenhouse gas inventories um, that we've recorded. Uh, the last line there is uh, uh, a dotted line because we still haven't finished uh, verifying all of the numbers. But basically, that's what's the history of greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland. Uh, the orange line was what the previous statute required us to meet, uh, a 25% by 2020, 40% by 2030. The Climate Solutions Now Act uh, changed that standard for the uh, 2030 to a 2031 standard and made it 60% rather than um, rather than 40%. Now you look at this chart and it looks like, well, we're just on the glide path and we need to continue on the same glide path. Uh, but the reality is that the reason why that blue number went down is because we picked a lot of low-hanging fruit. A lot of it was the conversion of coal plants to natural gas plants uh, because natural gas was cheap. And so it was fairly easy to switch from coal to natural gas uh, without any great economic disruption unless you were a worker on one of those coal plants. Um, at the same time, uh, car mileage increased and we, um, we improved a lot on the energy efficiency. But, but those low hanging fruits are gone. Um, each additional 1% decline that we're going to try to achieve through that red line is magnitudes more difficult than the percentage that we um, uh, sought before. Uh, next slide. Yeah, Susan or Anne, yeah, okay. Um, this is just, I'm not going to try to go through everything in this slide, but one of the things that the department did was look at our previous plans for gas reduction, make some adjustments for the fact, as the Senator mentioned, we're treating methane differently now under the new plans, and said, even if we had taken the most optimistic version of the previous plans, would we be able to achieve uh, the numbers in 2031 that the new statute gets? Uh, and, and this shows that we would fall short, that if you see that in black on the right, an 11% gap or 13.3. But frankly, this is a very unrealistic slide. Um, admittedly so, the department agrees. This is an optimistic scenario that assumes we're going to get things out of Congress that if you really think Congress is going to pass some of the things in this scenario, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to talk about selling to you because you're more gullible than I am. Uh, so, but even under those unrealistic assumptions, uh, we would not have achieved it. Uh, next slide. This is a very busy slide, but I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is the heart of uh, my presentation. Um, each of the colors indicates a particular sector of our current inventory 
of, uh, of greenhouse gases. Blue is transportation. Green is energy generation. Yellow is buildings. Um, the, the light gray is a non-combustion uh, sources. Um, the middle ring is sort of the categories. The outer ring are subcategories. So for example, 29.5 million metric tons of our current inventory is from transportation. And the vast majority of that, 18.4 tons, is from on-road gasoline. So we're really talking about uh, passenger vehicles, cars uh, being the primary source of, the, um, of those gases. Um, in the electric generation side, the, the 18.2, you can see that um, uh, uh, nine of it is imported from outside the state. Uh, yellow is buildings, et cetera. So this is where it currently comes from. That orange internal slice is how much cuts we need to make in the next eight years to meet the goal set forth in the statute. Um, so somewhere within those outer two rings, we have to find the equivalent of that orange slice. Um, now, a lot of times I talk to groups and, and it, they seem to come in with the assumption, well, we close the coal plant and we block up all those smokestacks I see coming from industry and we get to um, the goals for climate change. As you can see from this chart, it, it's nothing is further from the truth. Um, coal plants are that 3.9 down in the bottom sector. Um, the industry sector is that dark gray, three up at the top. Even if we totally eliminated both of those, uh, we've only made a small fraction of the 35 cut that we have to make. And the coal, as an example, though, you don't, you can't assume they're totally going to disappear. The 3.9, all of those coal plants are going to close. But what are they going to be replaced by? Uh, if they're replaced by additional imports, which right now I think a large portion of them would be if we did it today, um, then that, a lot of that is natural gas. So you really haven't eliminated 3.9 metric tons. You've reduced the 3.9 metric tons because natural gas is about half the emissions of coal. Um, obviously, the three a million metric tons from industry, you might be able to reduce it. I don't think our organized labor friends are going to want to eliminate it. Um, so you have to, within this numbers, find 35 and even more important, you got to find 35 within the next eight years. I'll give you an example. Um, the 18.4 for uh, the cars obviously stands out. That's the biggest single sector. Um, car and driver and other sources say that the average car sold today, average car, will be on the road for 12 years. We've got eight years to make this cut. Um, you've got to assume that every car sold today, will that most of them will still be on the road. So a cut there is difficult. Uh, if you look at the power generation side, we're importing 9 million metric tons. Making a sizable cut in that import uh, to replace it with renewable is going to require the construction of a lot of facilities. That's not going to be easy to do. So keep this in mind as I now talk about what the commission has is going to look at all of these options. And we're going to seek input from you and other members of the public on where we should make those cuts. As a preliminary matter, we've looked at two areas. And I'm going to talk mostly about those areas in the rest of uh, uh, my talk as our priority issues. Uh, the first being the transportation sector, and in particular, um, that 18.4. The second issue is that our whole scheme of, move, of reducing emissions is based upon electrification, as the, as the senator um, referred to, taking things off of fossil fuel and put it on electrification, and then supplying the electrification with renewable energy. So one of the things we have to do is figure out how do we um, assure that the, the 
sources we move to electricity are supplied by renewable power and we build that renewable power quickly enough. So our two focuses this year, primary focus, not sole focus, will be on uh, light duty transportation and um, energy generation. The next slide. On transportation, um, there's no question that there is a huge increase in percentages of cars that are zero emission vehicles. Um, we've um, uh, nearly doubled the percentage of cars in the state that are electric vehicles are plug-in. But doubling means we went from a little over 2% to a little under 5% of the cars. Um, Maryland had proposed 600,000 zero emission vehicles by 2030. Currently we're at 30,000 zero emission vehicles, 17,000 plug-in hybrids. And the plug-in hybrids, some of them have very limited range on electricity. So you really can't count them as fully um, zero emission vehicles. Um, so the bottom line here is we, we're not getting to the goals that we need to get to. Um, there was passage this last year of the Maryland Clean Cars Act of 2022. I'm not, um, I, I don't mean to cast aspersions on that. I think that was a, a good step in the right direction, but most of the funds for that will be used to pay people who were, um, had already bought electric cars and were entitled to refunds and didn't get it or uh, are gonna be exhausted very quickly. Um, one of the things it did was reduce the, the number of brands that would qualify for the zero emission vehicles by putting a cap on the, on the price. So Teslas, which are 75% of the cars on the road, no longer get any credit, um, either on the federal level or the state level. Um, they, we're just not going to get to the kind of numbers we want if we decide that the transportation sector, in particular light vehicles, are a, um, are a key uh, issue for us. Next slide. So some of the issues we're going to look at on the commission and the mitigation work group this year as to how we address that. Um, one of the first is, if we're going to do new incentives, where do we put them, right? Uh, do we provide an incentive for a vehicle? Do we provide an incentive for electric charging? Do we provide um, uh, incentives for both? There is a lot of federal money coming down the road for chargers. Um, there's both a settlement from Volkswagen over their emissions issues uh, and federal funds in um, some of the um, incentive acts that will put a lot of chargers, particularly along highways and major transportation routes, um, but not a great deal on cars. There was a proposal in the Biden administration for an incentive for cars and an extra incentive if the cars were made in a unionized shop. Uh, right now that's bottled up in committee and um, last I've heard the, the extra amount for the unionized uh, cars probably will not happen uh, and there's some question about whether the um, rest of the incentives will exist. Um, one of the things when we talk about charges is where do we put them? As I said, there's a lot of federal money coming down to put charges along highways. On the other hand, most people think that the majority of the charging will occur overnight at, in, at homes and at workplaces. Um, so if we were looking purely at where the charges will be used most often, those will be the locations, but there's an environmental justice issue. If we're just paying incentives to people who have private garages and driveways, um, then obviously there's an environmental justice issue. Um, similarly, it's an environmental justice issue with providing incentives for vehicles. Most of the most common uh, zero emission vehicles are very expensive. There appear to be some cheaper ones coming down the pipeline, but we don't know whether they really will be cheap by the time they get here. Um, so how do we increase the number of zero emission vehicles without this becoming an environmental justice issue where we're basically going the wrong direction? There's also an issue been raised, and this 
really came primarily out of uh, some efforts in Washington State. What do we um, incentivize? Um, the way I put this is, if what I've done is given an incentive to somebody who's got a plug-in Prius um, and replaces them with a fully electric Prius, or they just got a regular Prius and I get the, them to replace it with an electric Prius, I haven't reduced the greenhouse gas as much. If on the other hand, I can get somebody who's driving a Ford, a Navigator or, an, or an, uh, a big Cadillac SUV uh, and replace that with an electric vehicle, I get a lot more bang for the buck, if you will. Um, similarly, if I can replace someone who's commuting a very long distance to, um, or driving lots of mileage uh, with an electric vehicle, then I can um, uh, get much more of a bang for buck than I can with someone who is only driving a few miles, uh, but gets the same incentive if historically would have gotten the same incentive as someone who's getting a lot more miles. Um, can we provide incentives for used vehicles? Right now, our, our, our existing incentives are only for brand new vehicles. There's obviously an environmental justice impact of that. On the other hand, if you're, um, are, are you displacing a, a gas vehicle with, um, if you give an incentive for electric vehicle? Those are kind of issues we look at. Obviously, mass transit. I'm talking about electric vehicles, but one way to reduce the uh, environmental justice concerns is to also make sure that mass transit is part of our, our uh, equation here. Uh, if you notice, I haven't mentioned vehicle miles traveled, which are often talked about. Um, that is an issue, and it has a lot of benefits if you can reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. But as you transition to electric vehicles, um, interestingly enough, vehicle miles traveled may be less important. If someone is on an electric car and they're charging off of solar, then, um, then the number of miles do not produce additional greenhouse gases. The last question is one we're going, the legislature is definitely going to have to um, wrestle with. Obviously, we're depending upon gas sales currently for all our road construction and maintenance, um, electric vehicles do not pay that. Next slide. Now I mentioned the other issue that we're gonna focus on is renewable energy. Um, we hear a lot about renewable energy, but the truth is we're, the pace of building new solar farms in Maryland has slowed. Um, and the large utility scale, uh, um, facilities, the, the, the ones that require what are called CPCN, Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. Um, there's only seven in the state um, and we're, that are operational. There are considerably more number have been granted permits but are just not being built or haven't been built. Um, why do we have this bottleneck? Why are so few plants being built. Um, I don't think the problem is, this is personal opinion, I don't think the problem is at the PSC or with the state permitting process that seems to be going pretty quickly. Um, but if you look at it, we're talking about at least six years, and in some cases much longer, to get a permit be issued. So what's the delay? One was we had bottlenecks at PJM. PJM is the regional it's based on the name originally was Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. Um, it's a much bigger region than that now. Is the regional um, authority which regulates connections to our grid. Um, there were bottlenecks there, and they actually to call a, a two year uh, moratorium. Those bottlenecks appear to be coming clean uh, or clearing up and becoming a bit faster, but we're still in a situation where. If somebody filed today, um, they're probably not going to get their interconnection agreement till 2026. So that's a problem, but it appears to be getting better. Secondly, during the Trump administration, um, there was a significant tariff placed on the import of, um, of Chinese panels. And virtually all of the solar panels are made in China and imported. And because of that, it just became uneconomic for 
many solar farms to build. Um, President Biden has issued an executive order suspending that tariff for two years. We're hopeful that will open up that issue, though the, his executive order may be litigated. But the last issue we're seeing a lot of is local opposition slowing it up. Uh, we, ha we have one large uh, wind farm that's been proposed in Maryland called Dan's Mountain. Um, and this is 10 years after it's been proposed and it's still in litigation, um, hasn't been built. Um, I know of uh, solar farms that have been tied up with local opposition for six years or more. Uh, it, it does not mean that there may not be legitimate concerns about where solar farms are, are being located. But if we're going to have a significant expansion of solar farms in eight years, then we got to look at where we can build them and do we have sufficient locations to build them. Um, and we have counties that have just sectioned off large portions of the county and said, you're not going to build any um, uh, solar farms there. I don't think it's coincidental that uh, uh, half of all the solar farm capacity in the state is on the eastern shore, uh, where opposition has been a little less stringent. Um, I think a question should be raised of why in Montgomery County and Prince George's County are there not more solar farms being built. Next slide. This is the, the actual schedule of the things that the mitigation working group is going to be looking at this year. And you can see the first two light duty vehicles and electricity we put first since we think those are our principal issues, but we're not done with those. Uh, we had presentations and the presentations are available on the Department of the Environment website on those two issues to get the discussion started. Uh, we are looking at having uh, small subgroups, we call them, uh, look further at that issue and develop um, some recommendations for the mitigate the larger mitigation work group to consider. Uh, I fully expect that this whole year will be spent looking at those issues, and I don't necessarily think we're going to end them this year uh, or end discussion of those this year, but we would like to be in the position to come back and make some recommendations to the General Assembly on if we should do something on those categories, and if so, what. Uh, our next meeting in July will be, fo will be focusing on buildings. Um, as the Senator referred, um, we've got a lot of detail work we have to do on buildings. We know um, the energy performance standards have to be developed, a, a building codes have to be developed, but um, we've got to see uh, how those are being implemented uh, and then um, oversee, if you will, the implementation and development of the standards. Uh, in August, heavy duty vehicles, because although the light duty vehicles, the cars, are the biggest portion of the uh, problem. The heavy duty vehicles are a significant part. In some ways they could be easier or they could be harder. Right now there's not electric trucks available um, uh, in any number that we could use to replace the on-road um, development. There's some possibilities that that area may be uh, more easier to handle with something like hydrogen or for example, uh, trucks that go in and out of the port, where we could do charging in the port. There's a lot of discussion needs to happen. September 23rd, we're looking at the manufacturing issue. We've got a study going on right now about whether, whether um, uh, lifting any restrictions that we currently have on emissions from manufacturing should be um, changed. Then October, we hope to have put together some proposals, what the recommendations are. So that's why it's important even over the summer, if you have an interest in this issue or some issues you'd like us to consider, to give us the input. Because as of December 20th, we're going to try to sit down and say, okay, with our recommendations and with what's been developed um, by the uh, other uh, sectors of the government which are developing, like the Building Code Administration, uh, 
are we on path to get to the 60 by 30? And look, if it's not been clear to you, this is really hard. Um, it cut that 35. Uh, one way of looking at it is we eliminated every single car, truck, and vehicle in the state um, tomorrow. Uh, we would not achieve that number. Uh, if we tomorrow banned the sale of every vehicle that was not electric and had nobody could ever buy another gasoline powered car in Maryland, we would not meet that number. If tomorrow we closed every single natural gas plant in the state, we would not meet that number. So obviously we're gonna to have to pull together a lot of different pieces and we've got eight years to get to it, but frankly, eight years is not very long. So um, we certainly welcome any input that anyone has. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, Amy, I think you were gonna have questions and answers now. Yes, thank you, Mike, and also Kim, Senator Pinsky, and Dr. Dorsey for all of that great information um, on the Commission, the Climate Solutions Now Act, and our next steps. So at this time, we'll start addressing questions. Again, please use the Q&A feature as part of Google Meet. You can submit questions through the activities icon that looks like three generic symbols down at the bottom right hand corner of your meeting window. And now I'd like to welcome Chris Beck of MDE, who will moderate this portion of the webinar. Chris? Thanks, Amy. Um, I, I, a couple of questions did come in uh, during, the, during the talk, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and address them uh, in the order they came in. Um, Diana asked a few questions about, about the, buildings, uh, the, the building's work. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, the building's regulation uh, will be developed over the course of the next 14 months and and that and part of that and, and, and in that within that process this, the, the department will work with uh, the regulatory development group to do uh, significant outreach and get input from 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 the, from the 9,000 buildings that we think that will, 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 will fall within the, fall within this regulation and, and get get input from from all the affected stakeholders on what that regulation uh, should look like. So the answer to my, the answer to the question is I don't have the answer to that question because we don't know how that process will shake out. Um, but I encourage I, I encourage everyone to participate in that public process as as we put that reg together. Chris, could you read the questions, please? Sure. Uh, Diana asked. I have several questions regarding buildings. Given that the Maryland General Assembly removed the provisions regarding reduced energy use in buildings. Uh, in parentheses, site energy use intensity goals. Will will the MDE be able to require reductions of energy use in the regulations? Uh, well, the regulations must meet several specified requirements, and one of those is to include energy use intensity targets by building type as specified. So that's the work that we need to do over the next 14 months to figure out how that how that will work. Um, at the same time, we're we're offering you know we'd like to offer maximum flexibility to the owners of these covered buildings. Um, we recognize that there's going to be some potential disparities that will come up in terms of equity, and um, you know this is going to cost this is going to cost building owners um, money, and 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 I think that those those disparities will come up in this public process, and we look forward to working with those with those individuals to address those 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 disparities as best we can with the regulation itself, um, and also that that task force is designed to provide incentives to the to the impacted parties. Um, and the recommendations from that task force, I think, will be quite informative. Um, a second follow-up question from Diana was also with no SEUI targets. Um, I think EUI's energy use energy use intensity uh, aren't low-income housing isn't isn't low-income housing vulnerable to being shifted to expensive to operate all electricity resistant heat? Well, Maryland Maryland MDE is 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 well aware of of how electric resistant heat. Is, is not a solution and and that will be you know I think that the modeling exercise will will be informative in, in, in determining that 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 inefficient heat is not going to be the solution that we're looking for so does this question does this need remediating legislation well that's that's up to this that's up to the, the to the legislators um, I don't have the answer to that um, any follow-up on that interrupt me if, if you need to, to chime in I'd appreciate it if, if anyone has anything to add um, uh, Diane asked a third question. 
Uh, she said, I think that the Clean Cars Act only applies to cars purchased in 2024 and after. Um, based on my recollection, I think that any car purchased after July 1, 2023 would be eligible for those incentives. So, um, you know, it's based on, it's a, it's, a, it's a reg, so it's based on fiscal year, and the state fiscal year starts on July 1 in 2023. So if you purchase and title a car anytime after July 1st, 2023, you're eligible for that incentive. Um, we're moving through these pretty quickly, actually. So um, Larry, Larry Shiflett asked, what area of the plan addresses deforestation? If we're looking to be a national global leader in climate change, shouldn't we also speak, act on this? If you look around, Maryland, in Maryland, there are a tremendous amount of invasive vines choking out trees. Uh, I, su um, I suppose that, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to chime in on that one, Chris. Uh, we are looking at um, the carbon sink side of this, if you will, as well, right, which is uh, additional forestation. Um, and uh, I didn't list those. Um, because one, there are significant efforts already undergoing on those. And secondly, um, it's not necessarily going to be a huge portion of that 35 million metric tons. Right? It, can, it, it uh, clearly is something we cannot neglect, clearly something we have to do, but I wouldn't necessarily equate that to taking uh, a huge number of cars off the road. Also, um, we, our, our partners at, at, at DNR, they, they, have, uh, they have a number of, of forestry programs, and, and, and many of them focus on management alone. Um, in addition to planting and growing trees as part of the True Solutions Now Act, um, there are several programs that work on you know, uh, uh, managing forests so they more, are, are, more, are more healthy and, and ultimately sequester more carbon. And Chris, if I could, sure. um, you know, originally the uh, five million trees was part of the uh, last year's climate solutions bill. We, since that bill didn't pass, we added it to another piece of legislation and it calls for five million trees with uh, 500,000 of them being in uh, urban areas. We understand that just planting the trees isn't enough. It's got to be maintenance, that not all trees will survive. So uh, we understand part of the expenditure uh, is going to be on maintaining that. Um, obviously, uh, it's easier to maintain a, a large forest of trees than it is in an urban environment where you have other left fewer impediments. But clearing out other invasive species is very important. Uh, planting five million trees we think will be very significant in trying to absorb carbon dioxide. It will take years, we understand that. Um, but we also understood that it just doesn't mean you plant five million trees and they all survive. So. Um, maintenance will be a, a key part going forward. Thanks, Senator. Um, Chris, if I can jump in real quickly too, and just to remind folks that the Adaptation uh, and Resiliency Work Group focuses on this question uh, distinctly, so you can check their work out um, via the website. Thanks. Uh, Kathleen Field asks, is is, nu is nuclear energy within the envisioned energy source mix? Um, yes, um, I stress the solar and wind, um, not because nuclear is not part of our mix. Currently, um, Calvert Cliff supplies about forty one percent of our our power, and does it obviously with non carbon production. Now, I, I realize there are some. Um, controversy about that but but that is the reality of the day but we've got an eight-year deadline right and i don't think anybody realistically thinks we're going to build a, another large nuclear plant within eight years there is research about the smaller modular plants there's some reason for hope there but um i think with that tight a deadline we might have to start with with that technology which has already been licensed and in, in existence um the 2045 net zero deadline is another issue there um i definitely think we need to look at nuclear again recognizing there are different opinions on that yeah chris if i could um speaking to the climate solutions now act uh when it passed the senate it was silent on um nuclear energy uh, it's a debatable issue. 
um, is it safe? Uh, while we understand that Western Europe, Spain, France have used a, a lot of it, uh, some countries in Europe are cutting back on it. Um, you know, Chernobyl wasn't that long ago or Three Mile Island, so they're still concerned. So we decided not to take up that issue in, in the Senate, um, leave it for another day. Uh, the House did add some language that talked about uh, no or low carbon, which sort of opens the door a little bit without naming nuclear. Uh, but I think that's a discussion that the people of Maryland have to have, um, whether they think it's the appropriate or not, whether it's safe or not. Um, the uh, Calvert Cliff will come up in a few years, um, and then there'll have to be the decision whether to extend it or not. So uh, I think some of those questions are yet to be determined. We, we didn't want to take on every fundamental and controversial issue uh, this past legislative session. So uh, I think some of those issues are yet to be determined. Thanks, Senator. Um, an another, another, another tricky issue, uh, Lou asked, uh, the act spoke of incorporating methane emission reductions as part of future plans. At this time, where does the commission see potential emission reductions of methane coming from? Well, first of all, in, in, in the law, we changed the horizon from 100 years to 20 years. We, we thought that was a more accurate uh, capture, uh, hating to use that term, uh, of, of the numbers uh, of emissions. There, there, is new, there are a couple of things. First of all, we have to understand where it's leaking from first. And I'm not sure we have a full handle on that. As I mentioned, um, we've been getting different readings from some of our landfills across the state. Uh, we want to get accurate readings. Uh, some land uh, at, at, at ground level have been smaller than um, uh, readings from the sky. Now, obviously from the sky, you also get air from other places. But the technology has really gotten very advanced. And uh, the flyovers, the plumes, if you look at it in red, it's, it knocks your head around that it's so stark. So one, we have to get a, an accurate reading. Methane also comes out uh, from leaky pipes. Um, and look, there's a lot of pipe under the ground, you know, and, and, and tracking that is not an easy task. And that's not my area of expertise, but as it's explained to me, it is a challenge. So um, because it is so severe and, and such a major contribution, we have to get a better handle on that, uh, get better technology, look to the experts, um, but we cannot ignore methane. Absolutely, we cannot. Thanks. Uh, Tim Trostel uh, asked, increased demand for electricity will require new electric transmission lines to many of our populated areas. These are very costly and take many years to get site approval to build. Uh, he puts parentheses, not in my backyard. Any thoughts on this? I, I, it's part of what um, we were referring to when we said the difficulty of getting enough renewable plants built. Um, there are uh, task forces being run out of the power plant research program on uh, what it will take to get to be 100% renewables and the hurdles that will have to be undertaken. So they're looking at that. But it, it is a big um, uh, hurdle to, to, to uh, surmount because uh, it's not merely locating the, the uh, solar farms, it's also getting the transmission lines uh, built. Uh, but those are the challenges we're going to try to figure out. We're also hoping that um, there's some national leadership on this as well through the infrastructure bills and conversations and funding, because it, Maryland's not unique in this, right? Every state's got to struggle with this. So we're also tracking what's happening at the federal level. Thanks. We have a question about... Um, Electrification. The question is, can the electricity grid support the amount of electricity being called for? I don't think anybody thinks the current grid can. I think the question is, uh, can there be upgrades? Uh, and that, again, is one of the things that we have uh, task forces looking at, uh, a planning group uh, trying to figure out what upgrades would be necessary and on what timeline. Um, yeah, I'm not minimizing the question. It's a very legitimate question. All I can tell you is that there are people 
people are working very hard on trying to figure out how to get from here to there. And, and Chris, I, I will also say, I know we're getting to the, near the end of our time. Look, there are some people who want to keep the status quo uh, because it's in their best interest. Uh, it affects their, their corporation and their company's bottom line. And um, we've got to look past that. We, we can't let the uh, uh, private profit margins decide the future of the state, this country, and this world. Um, so we have to look at what's best for the, the broad populace. And we have to get those reductions down. If not, the cost to every citizen, every company is going to be monumental. We won't even understand the, the import. Um, you know, foodstuffs around the world, uh, floods, uh, droughts. So if we don't get a hold of this and, and we let um, someone's bottom line uh, hinder our efforts forward, that's a problem. So um, we've got to look at, we have to let science lead um not uh, private capital thanks maybe a, 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 a time for a, maybe one or two more questions um there's a question about uh the transportation sector the question is 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 clean natural gas for for heavy duty trucks being considered to support emission reductions in the transportation sector yeah i, I mean the obviously department of transportation and, and our friend earl, earl lewis has is the best one to answer that, but they are definitely looking at that as a, as a potential um, solution. Um, nothing's being left out. Most of my conversation about electrification dealt with the light duty vehicles, which of course are a very different category. I have a question um, that pertains to, to, to buildings. Um, it's from, from T. Johnson. What is the status of the Maryland Green Building Council's high performance uh, green building program? Is it still valid? Um, Chris, it's still valid, it's still in place. We tried to strengthen it actually in the first iteration of our bill um, to, to up the ante some. Um, I, at the end of the day, there was some reticence um, so we didn't make any significant changes to it, but the Green Building Council is still in place. The Green Building Standards are still in place. Um, so I, I think in our efforts going forward, we actually have to use it to build. I, I hate to use the term build on, um, but, but in terms of, you know, the, the structures, whether it's large office buildings, retail buildings, multifamily, um, we have to have the architects and design and plans that are going to lead us to 2030 and 2040 and 2050. It can be done. You know, I, I used the example of the Empire State Building. A multi-million dollar redo was done at the Empire State Building about five or seven years ago. And they made it into a green building. Mm -hmm. You know, and they actually are going to get a return on investment in a very modest time uh, horizon. Uh, I want to say four to six years. And after that, they're going to save money. You know, and when they redid the building, they looked at creative uh, efforts, not just windows. When they took out their elevators, they put in new elevators that create energy. You know, and I think we have to think out of the box uh, and use some of these, our smart young people in college now and people investing in technology to, to break new barriers and, and use it. Uh, we can do this. We really can. Thanks. Um, and one more question. Uh, th this, this is regarding um, the definition of covered buildings, which we have we, we have a definition of covered buildings in the bill. So, so the question is, uh, th does, does covered buildings include maintenance buildings, which are currently exempt under the high performance green buildings program? You know, this bill supersedes uh, other language. So if they're not, I don't remember. I don't believe they're excluded, um, so that means they're covered. Um, if they're over 35,000 square feet, they're covered. Exactly. If they fill the other criteria, the square footage, and they're not excluded in other language, they're, they're included. All right. Well, I think we're just about at time, so I just wanted to jump back on. I wanted to... Um, Thank everyone for attending this webinar on the Climate Solutions Now Act. And 
thank again our speakers, Dr. Dorsey, Senator Pinsky, Kim, and Mike, and our questions moderator, Chris Beck. Um, the slides that were presented here will be posted on the commission webpage in the next couple of days. And again, a recording of this webinar will be posted to YouTube as well. So thank you all for attending, and this concludes this webinar.